Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the lecture series of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Ahmed Khan from the School of International Studies at the University of the Pacific. Ahmed earned his PhD in anthropology at Harvard University and subsequently held postdoctoral positions at the University of Iowa and at Trinity College uh, in Hartford, Connecticut. Since 2009, he has been our neighbor at the University of the Pacific, where he is assistant professor of anthropology. Uh, teaching courses on urban anthropology and the modern Middle East. His research interests include globalization, urbanism, and empire, and the cultural geography of places and cities uh, like Dubai, a city which, uh, on which he has written extensively. He is the author of Dubai, the City as Cooperation, uh, which came out of the University of Minnesota Press in 2011. He's also the editor of the Superlative City, Dubai and the Urban Condition in the Early 21st Century, which is coming out of the uh, Harvard Twenty Two Design, uh, actually came out already. Uh, and he's also the co-editor of Rethinking Global Urbanism, Compacted Insights from Secondary Cities, uh, which came out of Routledge last year. He is indeed a very prolific author. His lecture today, uh, which I note is in fact different than the lecture that was advertised in our poster, to my delight, although not, not necessarily her, but it's delight, uh, is titled Everyday uh, Empire in Dubai, Urban and Spatial Effects uh, of the Long Imperial Encounter. Please join me in, in welcoming the session. Thanks to all of you for, uh, for coming on this beautiful afternoon. I, I noticed uh, Berkeley students were all uh, bicycling and uh, throwing frisbees, so it's not easy to come in and listen to a, a long talk on an obscure place, but uh, I will do my best to, to, make, to redeem your uh, honor. So, um, yeah, my apologies for uh, changing the title and the topic. I was working uh, very, very hard this summer uh, on the other paper, and it simply was not coming together. It was I was barking up too many trees, and so I decided to uh, to give a talk about a topic that I'm a bit more familiar with and, and more comfortable sort of um, delving a bit more deeply into. So uh, the other topic um, I can also talk about in the Q and A and, and discuss um, as well. So. Um, so, it is uh, almost a truism that uh, Dubai and familiar cities in the Arab Gulf are characterized by highly visible cultural and even racial differences. Some might even say segregation. The explanation for this generally focuses on oil wealth. On the one side, petrodollars have enabled Emiratis, or citizens of the United Arab Emirates, of which Dubai is the largest city, to retreat among themselves, content in their material comforts, and seldom feeling the need to engage with the large group of non-Emiratis sharing their country. On the other side, and this is a, uh, this is a story that I'm sort of uh, summarizing here, the story that, that we're told. On the other side, foreigners in the United Arab Emirates um, uh, go there for mainly uh, economic reasons. They go there to work, make good money, and return to their countries of origin after a few years. That's the, the basic story that, that, um, that a lot of my interlocutors and my fieldwork uh, both local and foreign, as well as many scholars and journalists, tell about the modern Gulf. Um, however, in this talk I discuss, uh, uh, as I discuss in this talk, the story leaves out human motivations and projects that cannot be reduced uh, to a neoliberal theory of rational profit maximization. Indeed, as will become clear, I hope, cultural exclusivism, we might even say segregation, has deeper roots in a place like Dubai. The history, this history goes back to the time of the British Empire, I argue, a history that leaves important marks even on the present day, not least on everyday Dubai spaces of leisure and consumption. In her path-breaking book, A Joint Enterprise, Indian Elites, and the Making of, Modern, of, making of British Bombay, Bombay, the architectural historian Preeti Chopra asks a deceptively uh, simple question. What is a colonial city? She goes on to point out that while two, two decades of scholarship have made it clear that cities are key to understanding the history and legacies of colonialism, she writes, quote, however, the scholarship has also made it evident that we still do not really know how colonial cities came into being and operated, nor what their role was in the historical sociology, the historical sociology of colonialism, end quote. Arguing against the tendency to think of colonial cities as products of Quote, the singular visions and needs of colonial regimes that founded them, 
Chopra shows how Bombay's built environment and, built, and public culture between the 1850s and the First World War were products of what she calls a joint enterprise, an intentional cooperation between colonial administrators and local elite philanthropists. While I do not want to overextend the analogy either to colonialism or to Bombay, a far more central British imperial city than Dubai ever was, I nevertheless found, find it useful to extend, both conceptually and temporally, Chopra's notion of the joint enterprise, to show how a large part of Dubai's urbanscape has been formed. As I discuss in more detail momentarily, the history of Dubai and specifically important aspects of its urbanscape, such as privatized leisure spaces, trafficking in a kind of colonial nostalgia, cannot be understood without reference to Dubai's situation as a node in British imperial networks. While Dubai was admittedly regarded as a backwater by London and by the British Raj, uh, the imperial encounter nevertheless both exercised a major effect on Dubai's political, social, and urban development as it did on that of the Arab Gulf more generally. The town was also, was also experienced by British and subsequently other Global North citizens in, uh, as in a typical imperial pattern. In turn, Dubai elites, the ruling family above all, but also allies of the ruling family, drew upon British patronage and Western ideologies of free trade, consumption, and racial management to help produce, or as Chopra might say, co-produce urban space in post-independence Dubai. However, while I find Chopra's notion of the joint enterprise helpful in critiquing top-down understandings of imperial global urbanism, I argue in this paper against what might be called the geography of imperial urban centrality, underpinning much of the discourse on imperial cities. This is a discourse that privileges certain parts of the urban geography of empire, such as Bombay and others, as more revealingly imperial than so-called backwaters, such as Dubai. By contrast, I try to highlight the ways that even tiny and significant way stations, um, such as Dubai, were deeply impacted by their enrollment in the imperial project. I therefore shift the analysis of imperial urbanism away from conversations about what is imperial about cities, more emphatically to a discourse of imperial urbanism as a process. More specifically, I look at the ways in which imperial hierarchies, especially those pertaining to race, were and are reproduced in daily activities and spaces. That is, I employ the category of everyday space to analyze the ways in which legacies of race and security were adapted from the imperial context to the post-independence context in Dubai. Empire did not, did not help to produce monumental architecture, sweeping plazas, and I'm not trying to make empire into a reified agent here. In other words, the imperial time period did not produce monumental architecture, sweeping plazas, or a metropolitan culture in a city such as Dubai. Its main legacies were less visible or tangible, but equally important. So-called political stability, a Western dependent political class, and a role for, for the city as a global leisure and tax-free hub, and a shipping hub, as the US military knows very well. Um, thus, along with Chopra's notion of the joint enterprise, I draw upon Henri Lefebvre's analysis of the production of space to analyze the ways in which Leisure spaces both take shape in and reinforce the cultural politics of contemporary Dubai. What Lefebvre meant by the production of space is summarized most succinctly and quite effectively in his essay, The Urban Revolution, uh, published in the late 60s, where he writes, quote, that urbanism is, although unwittingly, class urbanism, end quote. Moreover, as Neil Smith has pointed out, not only is the spatial for Lefebvre processual, but, um, an always unfolding product of social contestation, but it is centrally connected to another category, that of the everyday, the central category of my paper. The everyday arena, not least that of leisure, consumption, what the Fable calls habitation, and language, becomes a central mode both for the reproduction and contestation of more abstract systems of power. Here I transpose Lefebvre's category of class as an analytic of social power to a post-colonial context where the reproduction of class is entwined with the production of race. I focus on the first element in the Lefebvrean dialectic of reproduction resistance to power, that is on the reproduction of social power. Um, and I show how spaces, such, I will discuss a number of spaces, uh, how these must be situated in the socio-political context of the formation of Dubai as an imperial backwater during the time of the British. 
how these spaces both reflected colonial and local Arab elite concerns with the management of cultural and racial difference, and how contemporary uh, Dubai bears in significant ways traces of what Chopra calls the joint enterprise. The urban social science literature has underemphasized the analysis of spaces of everyday life and the mundane as settings for the reproduction of imperial power. Scholarship on the distinct but related themes of imperial space and imperial urbanism has rather strongly tended, has rather strongly tended to approach uh, the question of space from the angles of security and of imperial spatial policing and surveillance. I discussed this in a, in a longer soon to be published version of this paper in more detail. Um, this tendency seems to be constant uh, regardless of the ideological or theoretical tendencies of the scholarship. So the Fabian critique of this scho uh, scholarly emphasis, one that is attuned to the everyday as an arena for the, re for the production of power relationships, is therefore, uh, uh, I argue, a necessary intervention. So let me talk a little bit about uh, a little bit of historical context. No. Although historically a, a backwater, as I mentioned, Dubai today is the largest city in the United Arab Emirates and a major Asian business and shipping hub, a rise to prominence in which the imperial legacy played one, albeit an important part. This can be seen in the ways that Dubai's rulers negotiated treaties with the British and how these alliances and the forms of governance based upon them were consolidated in the post-independence, post-1971 era. To summarize a long story, the political class of Dubai, the ruling Al Maktoum family and their allies from within uh, the indigenous merchant class, ensured stability by forming close politically dependent security relationships with Great Britain. Along, uh, among other things, this entailed the creation of specific kinds of urban spaces that reflected both British and Dubai elite political economic interests and cultural expectations across a spectrum of arenas, from the labor market to everyday cultural geographies of the city. Uh, and so on. In turn, the post-independence period, in, in the post-independence period, these kinds of spaces and the cultural expectations they both reflected and reinforced were adopted and adapted by other European and North American elite expatriates, along with a large number of local Emirati nationals. The geopolitics of the relationship between Britain and the UAE uh, has been discussed, uh, has been extensively discussed by several studies. Um, however, the everyday sociocultural and socio-urban effects of this imperial relationship have been generally ignored. What, kind of, what kinds of urban spaces and urban experiences were shaped by the imperial encounter? What everyday enactments, such as in consumption habits or the everyday uses of language, reflected this legacy? Contemporary issues, such as racial segregation and the meanings of urban security, when not studiously ignored, are treated as products of post-independence processes such as the political economy of oil or the management of the distinctive demography of the Arab Gulf states in the oil period. The British and the American imperial connection is in effect severed. An important part of the story is that of the British experience in the Gulf, a very understudied topic. It's very fascinating. Um, the story reveals that the everyday reproduction of imperial relations in the region in crucial ways. The interrelationship between imperial metropole and periphery, and specifically the ways that everyday spaces, both in the metropole and in the periphery, become sites for the production of, Euro of European identities and categories, what Anne Laura Stoller has called the realm of the intimate, is a topic which has animated post-colonial scholars for at least a generation. Alas, the insights of this research have barely touched studies of the Arab Gulf region. Uh, the work of geographers, Kate, uh, the geographer Katie Walsh and the historian Ann Coles, who has extensive experience living in the UAE, is an exception. And um, uh, in a recent article in Antipode, I think it was, I'm forgetting the journal, uh, they, they connect uh, the Gulf uh, to the uh, aforementioned post colonial conversations. In uh, the, uh, the piece, and I'm forgetting the title of it, I can look it up and, and, and let you know after the talk, uh, it's a recent piece in, I think, Antipode, 2010. The author highlight the ways, uh, they write, in which a post-colonial city traces continuity rather than disjuncture from its colonial predecessor in the nature and quality of social encounters which are shot through with notions of race, they write, and culture as markers of difference based on interaction. 
Um, I will skip, because of time, I will skip the rather lengthy disquisition on the article. And um, uh, Coles and Walsh are really interested in the everyday, as I'm, uh, as I'm sort of, in a similar way to, to one I'm uh, highlighting here. And they, they talk about, uh, for example, um, the creation of distinctively British spaces in uh, the UAE, other parts of the Gulf, British clubs, excursions to the desert to look at Bedouins and to, to therefore construct notions of authentic Arabness and so on. Um, one of the most interesting aspects of this is their discussion of food. Uh, and they write that between the 1970s and the 2000s, and I, I'll quote extensively here because I think it's quite interesting, there are quote, the food habits at home in the United Kingdom uh, were transformed between the 70s and the 2000s. Uh, once uh, foreign items, items once considered foreign, such as pizza, curry, and hummus, uh, have become everyday choices. And eating out, especially in ethnic restaurants, is considered normal. Yet British expatriates in Dubai rarely eat Middle Eastern food, they found. Even when they do, they often choose only familiar items, fruit shakes, chicken, chicken hummus, and fries. Uh, I'm sure. Fries and shifu chicks. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I can't imagine Ibn Battuta drinking <laughs> shifu. Right? Um, so, uh, this also had a deep impact, I think, this relationship had a deep impact on uh, the Gulf, of course, from the Gulf perspective. Um, and I base a lot of my insights on what I still think is one of the best studies of empire and everydayness in the Gulf, the political scientist Abdul Khalif Abdullah's quite old study by now. A political dependency, the case of the UAE, published in the mid-1980s, but still quite relevant today. Abdullah is still a big figure in the UAE as a political commentator, primarily in Arabic, uh, and writes really interesting articles in Arabic there as well. Uh, in any case, in his study, uh, Political Dependency, Abdullah shows how both British advisors and local actors, who he, whom he calls in a now rather awkward, but for that quite accurate language, the social instruments of political dependency, the UAE Emirati actors, played key roles in the UAE's post-independence trajectory. Abdullah's study also describes the collaboration of local royals of the British to marginalize or simply crush formations that the British saw as potentially upsetting uh, unimpeded imperial strategy. This story is quite familiar. Fred Halliday is a great study on this. Um, what's interesting is that um, Abdullah talks about, when he wants to talk about why this is so frustrating to an activist Emirati, uh, left-leaning, anti-colonial, he interestingly talks about the production of spaces, right? So he talks about, um, you know, he talks about the labor market, he talks about foreign managers, primarily British, brought in to run banks and, and to be experts and so on. Um, uh, he talks about the context of how Westerners feel comfortable in the UAE. Coles and Walsh also say, you know, they're feeling very comfortable. Meanwhile, the rest of the Arab world is going anti-colonial and nationalist, and Westerners are very uncomfortable there. So this idea of comfort, right? There's a politics of comfort uh, going on in this post-colonial context. Um, but Abdullah turns to space, right, to, to really, really uh, 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 embody why this is so frustrating. He says. Um, he, says the, he cites the plan by a prominent Dubai family in the 1980s to develop a, an ice skating project in the desert. An ice skating project. Now, those of you guys who know the, the, the more recent like ski slope right in the desert, um, you will recognize the resonance there. Um, so these are seen by Western commentators as, oh, either Dubai is crazy, they're, they're nuts, or, wow, this is great, we can go skiing in Dubai, we don't have to be uncomfortable. Um, but you know, a lot of local people, I talked to people, very everyday people who said, we feel like we're being colonized. You know, 2004, 2005, 2007, we feel like we're being colonized. You go to a, any public space, uh, it seems like it's just for Westerners. This discourse is really, really strong um, in, in, in the UAE. Um, so I also threw in a piece of what David Harvey talks about, pacification by cappuccino, and, uh, and Abdullah's study can be really characterized as quite a, it's, it tends to be a simplistic uh, at times, pacification by cappuccino um, uh, analysis, you know, he talks about beauty pageants, shopping malls, and so on, in the early 1980s. And he talks about them as an index of the political authoritarianism of a pro-Western government that he says invariably tends towards an authoritarianism, authoritarianism and politically marginalizing system embodied in the political deactivation of the populace." End quote. Um, so, 
I mentioned comfort and quality of life as the politics of comfort, right? So let me turn to that. The politics of quality of life, which we find today in the UAE, especially Dubai. Along with more globalized spaces of consumption, like the shopping malls, which uh, I discuss in the longer version and in the book that Nazar very kindly mentioned, Along with these kinds of spaces, Dubai is replete with other privatized spaces where Western expatriates need not feel pressure to deal with unfamiliar cultural expectations. <coughs> While places like resorts, British clubs, gay communities, and social clubs are very fascinating and they're talked about by Coles and Walsh in their very good article, um, Michelle Buckley at, at Oxford is also really doing some of the best work on, on Dubai now. She talks about this, I think. While these are fascinating kinds of space, let us look at yet another space which seems so trivial and so silly that it's not even maybe worth bothering with, the English pub. I also like to go to English pubs, so I have a chance to study them. So there are many, many pubs in Dubai uh, with names like the Viceroy, which an online review describes as, quote, a nice old colonial India themed pub. <laughs> Biggles, the Sherlock Holmes, etc., etc., etc. Uh, British and other expatriates often laud them for their atmosphere, which, unlike shopping malls or resorts, tend to focus on English-themed decor and brands, English sports, EPL, football, and thus evoke a strong sense of nostalgia while allowing one to feel as though one were among, among like-minded people. And like the title of the, pub, the article version of this is called A Group of Like-Minded Lads, which comes from a review of one of these pubs that I'm, just, I'm going to talk about now. Uh, the pub is called Waxy O'Connor's, which I realize is not technically an English name, but it's, it's presented as an English or Irish mm -hmm. pub. And there's a long review of it. There's a blog on, on, online called a noob, to, a noob to Dubai. Uh, and this English guy is reviewing various spaces in Dubai and why he loves Dubai so much. And he says, and let me quote again at length from his review of Waxy O'Connor's. As a noob into Dubai, when you get an email asking you if you want to go for brunch and a few beers, with few in quotes, a few beers, you jump at the chance. So fresh-faced and bushy-tailed, I turned up at Waxy O'Connor's, which is located uh, at such and such place. Upon entry, I was told to buy drinks vouchers, and was at first a little concerned when I was offered ten. I went for the safer option of five at a rather cheap price of 50 dirhams, or about uh, 10 US dollars. I joined the lads, who are, all, who are already all spelled A-L-L, -L, space, ready, tucking into large portions of English breakfast. My question was, how much was that? Answer, free. Just to, just to review, 50 dirhams, 8 UK pounds, buys one cooked breakfast as much as you can get, one roast dinner as much as you can eat, and five pints of beer. You have to be sturdy, like, you know, like, marathon. <laughs> so, and, um, so let me now resume with my narrative. So food consumption, as anthropologists and other, others know, are always highly symbolic. And this brief description of an early start on the day at an English pub, contains some of the basic elements of the Western expatriate narrative about why Dubai is so appealing. The affordable consumer well-being, the availability of the comforts of home, such as comfort food, and a major theme in conversations with expatriates that I had, the ability to circumvent local Muslim prohibitions of pork and alcohol, which many, many Westerners, I say, almost every Westerner I talked to was like, ah, oh, this is annoying, right? This, is, this place is great, but it's annoying, because it's got these damn Muslims, right? They, we can't eat what we want. Um, drink beer, five beers for eight times, right? So um, the reviewer's conclusion, this particular reviewer, indeed says volumes. He writes, overall, 10 out of 10. Great fun with a group of like-minded lads. And Waxies shows a whole lot of sport as well. Heaven. End quote. So it is important to note that not only is this, urban, uh, is this an urban geography produced for and often by Britons, but that it communicates comfort and a home away from home to non-British Europeans and North Americans as well. And to many South Asians, and, and actually Arabs as well, I have to admit, there were, I hung out with a lot of South Asians who were into this British pub culture too, so. Consider the, uh, but let's consider the following exchange I had with my Dutch neighbor, an oil company geologist. 
And when I bumped into him one day during my field research in 2004, he was polishing his highly prized Harley Davidson, which I had seen him clean and care for before, but which he kept in the garage next to his Porsche sports car, usually. We had not really uh, uh, talked before, so I asked him how so I asked him how he liked Dubai. He and his wife, he said, had only, been, had, had only then been in Dubai for a couple of years, but were thinking very seriously about moving to Australia soon to be, uh, to, uh, soon after we had been talking. They liked Dubai very much, he said, but one of their sons was studying in Brisbane, Australia, and they were thinking of joining him there. He said Australia is very big, and it, it's as big as America, he said, but it only has 18 million people, lots of space, uh, has farms that are bigger than Belgium, he said. Holland, Holland itself has 16 million people, he says. I asked him if he and his wife had any desire to move back to Amsterdam, their hometown. No way, he said. Too many immigrants have, have moved to the country recently. The atmosphere was becoming too aggressive. Holland was becoming a major thoroughfare for criminals who went there before moving on to the United Kingdom, France, and other places. So what's ironic about this uh, exchange is that my interlocutor says that he and his wife actually love Dubai. Uh, they don't want to move, but their son, they want to be closer to their son. Dubai is a city, as we all know, of at least 90% population is non-European, right? Um, and uh, so, you know, he, he said, we're reluctant to leave this city, uh, but we need to go to our son, etc. So like other expatriates from the global north, part of the reason for uh, their liking of Dubai is the ability, ironically, to have a much higher standard of living, as indicated by the Harley-Davidson and the car and so on. But another striking aspect of this comment is the uh, European racial anxiety it expresses, which both indexes an ongoing post-9-11 European sense of an Islam or immigrant colonization of, the, of Europe. Uh, interest, which interestingly con constructs a place like Dubai as a refuge from this increasingly complex uh, and for someone like my interlocutor, increasingly unappealing multicultural Europe. It should also be added that this sense of mobility, right, escape, there's a politics to mobility, this is maybe pretty clear, politics of comfort uh, and a politics of mobility going on here. And from this perspective, escaping when a place no longer suits you implies an imagined geography where places other than one's own home are valued only for what they offer one's standard of living. The actual place in question, Dubai, Australia, etc., uh, its complexity and so on, become secondary or even irrelevant. In this example, then, we see the specter, uh, I think, of a British-produced imperial space of Dubai as welcoming of Europeans. Uh, of Dubai as a post-colonial city in the sense that it becomes a space onto which Europeans can project their fantasies of bourgeois consumption, privacy, and mobility. Moreover, these spaces are not just about leisure and enjoyment. They, are, they become an important part of the project of racial and neo-imperial exclusion, a topic to which I now turn. Uh, and is my time okay, by the way? Okay, fine. Okay. Another 20 minutes. 20 minutes, great. Um, during my fieldwork, Emiratis often discussed with me both the positive aspects and the discontents of what they called often modernity, al-hadatha, al-tahadr, and in a euphemism for modernization, al-tamadun, urbanization. Interlocutors often noted that along with the comforts of modern life and the excitement of an increasingly cosmopolitan, globalizing city, came a rise in urban an anonymity, crime, and dangerous if not illegal activities such as drug consumption and prostitution. While the tangible consequences of these uh, developments, such as physical insecurity, uh, uh, and what was often referred to as uh, the breakup of the family, tafakkuk al aida While these were important concerns, one of the more interesting common threads of these narratives is what can be referred to as dis discourses of respect or disrespect of Emirati Mus and Muslim customs that adat or taqalid was a category people often used. As one of my Emirati interlocutors, a highly educated 30-something woman, fluent in at least uh, in both Arabic and, and, and English, and probably also Persian, I would imagine. Uh, a manager at a local Dubai multinational, um, and also actually someone who considers herself a feminist and progressive. She was not like a, I'm a traditionalist person who hates Western stuff or whatever, you know. Uh, she said in the phrase I love, and I quote, it's, she says, it's enough, yani, 
It's enough yani. Right? <laughs> and yani is this thing it, 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 it means like literally in, it means in Arabic, but it's an emphatic particle. You don't it, you don't use it in its literal sense usually. Yeah, and like, God damn it, that's enough, right? <laughs> um, another highly educated Emirati and by local standards also a progressive woman. Uh, uh, who, who worked in marketing in another major Dubai multinational, plaintively told me about how, about how she and her compatriots felt colonized, her words, by arrogant Europeans who were, among other things, unaware of the fact that they received better pay for the same jobs that Arabs and South Asians did. She also described feeling sensorially assaulted by the immodest, what she considered the immodest dress of Europeans at, and, and North Americans at Dubai cafes and shopping malls. The feeling that among Emiratis of being excluded in one's own country, and similarly, the tangible sense both among, uh, among both Emiratis and other non-Europeans of the presence of a neo-colonial hierarchy which privileges Europeans and North Americans, or more accurately, European and North American bodied people. I have an American South Asian colleague, South Asian, uh, of South Asian background, and she says she gets some of the same uh, issues because her body looks South Asian, even though her identity is American, actually. So a, uh, a neo-colonial hierarchy, hierarchy which privileges uh, European and North American bodies, basically. These constituted common themes and conversations I had during my fieldwork. Therefore, while Dubai seemed an easygoing and welcoming place for expatriates from the global north, Emiratis, non-Emirati Arabs, and South Asians had generally more ambivalent and complex attitudes towards the city. The attachments and more positive attitudes um, uh, of the latter groups were often moderated by a more critical appreciation of the fact that stability, consumer well-being, and, le and leisure were based, often based upon structures of racial hierarchy and exclusion. And the next question I'd like to ask then, what are the spatial effects, the spaces, produced in this context? Um, so as I've shown so far, the production of Dubai as a refuge for European expatriates was largely the co-production of or joint enterprise of British and local Arab elites. Uh, now I'll discuss the legacy of this leaves in the contemporary context. I discussed that, what I just mentioned, at greater length in the, in the published version of this, soon to be published version of this. So spatial effects, the production of space. Let me begin with um, the question of racial hierarchy. As has been established by several studies, Dubai under the British exhibited a common colonial pattern in which imperial people could expect privileges and native people could not, and in which native people could expect coercion by the rulers when they protested. The results of this were predictable. Regardless of expertise or personal attributes, British could expect positions at the commanding heights of the political economy, while Dubai natives and other non-Europeans were generally a secondary. This was a system, as Robert Vitellis has noted for Saudi Arabia, that race built. It is interesting, moreover, to note the strong echoes of this system in the contemporary context. The privileging of British actors in, in the pre-independence context has remained strikingly intact up to the present day, and has even expanded into a system of privilege for other global north-bodied people. This leads, to, uh, this leads to my next question. What kinds of contemporary spaces are produced as effects of the system built by race? Scholars such as the anthropologist Angiano Alomba have discussed the intersection between the categorization of ethnicity, discourses of threat, and the segregation of space in the Arab Gulf. Focusing on Kuwait, Alomba has shown, for example, how South and Southeast Asian domestic workers are particularly associated with quote-unquote threats to the so-called traditional Muslim values. That are, uh, that are seen as vulnerable, uh, or so, sorry, these domestics are therefore vulnerable to accusations of adultery, right? Expanding on Longa's insight um, that the domestic sphere of the household constitutes a particularly vulnerable situation for foreign female workers, I have discussed elsewhere in, in the book that Ms. are mentioned how the design of the Dubai house interior, uh, uh, Dubai house interiors that are marketed to global middle class consumers strongly focus on the securitization of space and the segregation of house renters from domestic workers along with the marginalization, uh, along with the naturalization of this segregation. A few years ago I was struck by an article in the New York Times entitled Dubai Swats Pests Ogling Beach Beauties. The photograph accompanying the web version of the article 
showed five men who appeared to be of South Asian extraction and construction workers gazing at two white women in bikinis as they walked on the beach near the Burj Al Arab, a very famous Dubai hotel on, the, on, on Dubai Beach. It's worthwhile to look at this piece in detail. So let me quote at length again. I apologize for that. The writer writes, quote, As winter arrives in this Persian Gulf city, the masses are thronging by the tens of thousands to its white, sandy beaches, wearing in an unlikely exercise in maritime coexistence everything from black flowing abayas, long flowing gowns that women wear, to slinky bikinis. Thronging alongside them are Dubai's beach pests, gangs of men who trudge through the sand fully dressed to oval women. Uh, they interview uh, a, a German woman, Annika Greichen, uh, who says, they pretend to take pictures of their friends, but they are really taking pictures of you. Mm. I think I can understand it, she said. It's the only place they can have uh, a look at women, and it's probably true. It's a city that's, I think, 65 to 70 percent male, which is another distinctive aspect. The gendered aspect of the demography is interesting, as well as the ethnic as aspect. The article notes that the workers typically live in Dickensian squalor, the author's words, and describes how ridiculous they appear as they attempt to swim, entering the water, quote, wearing their traditional robes, end quote. Which is a curious statement, actually, because the men in the photo are wearing uh, shirts like this and trousers like this, and that's a typical outfit of a uh, South Asian uh, uh, construction worker, not robes. Right? Those are, those are Afghani workers, and they, do, they also work in construction, but the workers shown in this picture were Indian workers, and they're not wearing robes. Right? They're wearing Western clothes. So, but such a statement, uh, along with the German interlocutor's comments, is meant more to suggest that the that the, to, to the reader that these men don't know any better. The article continues, quote, Dubai officials keen to attract tourists have vowed to crack down with a security plan that includes plainclothes officers and a three strikes policy aimed at keeping out the worst offenders. A Dubai police spokesman, Hamis al mazaina said his department had built new watchtowers to scan the beaches and added 35 undercover policemen to patrol as beach bums, looking for the first signs of trouble, end quote. Though the article does quote Hamis al mazaina saying that the intention is not to bar anyone from the beach and that all people, uh, and that all those caught exhibiting signs of trouble will be treated with courtesy and respect. What is striking about this piece are both the way its descriptive and at times sarcastic tone reflects the larger racially structured system and the way it inadvertently reveals the spaces made by this system. Let us leave aside the obvious, the astonishingly insensitive, not to say blatantly racist, use of the term pests to describe South Asian men, and the condescending tone of the entire piece, which seeks to explain South Asian men's behavior by referring to their poverty and their culture. The more insidious and subtle a racial structuring of the space becomes clear when we begin to appreciate what is missing from this account. The gaze and behavioral patterns of middle class and European men, men who embody this racialized identity, can safely expect the safe to reflect their assumptions, that is, comfort and security. Specifically, they can expect not to be hauled into watchtowers, uh, camera phones confiscated, uh, numbers of strikes being tallied. It is only South Asian men's behavior and bodies that are surveilled and intervened upon in this way. From uh, beaches with watchtowers and secret surveillance, let us move to another kind of ubiquitous Dubai space, that of the privatized space of consumption. I mentioned the, pri the bars, now, uh, bars before, now let me talk about um, res uh, gated communities, for example. During my field research between 2002 and 2007, I interviewed and went on project tours with the project managers of, or operations managers, of several very prominent Dubai construction projects. These were either so-called mixed-use retail shopping tourism and residential, or shopping mall projects. Among the major themes of these conversations were the efforts to subtly create secure, comfortable spaces for affluent, local, and expatriate city residents. One of the effects of such discourse, I argue, was that the geography of Dubai became imagined as a boundary zone of class and racial management. In one interview, the project manager of a well-known and now world-famous Dubai shopping mall compared his project to another mall, then uh, one of Dubai's most well-known the Deira city center. The new mall was being developed in an affluent neighborhood in the western part of Dubai, as opposed to Deira city center in the eastern part, which is a more working class district. 
Uh, the western neighborhoods of Jumeirah, Umsafaim, and Emirates Hills, mentioned by the interviewee in my quote of him, were then the homes of affluent Arab, European, and South Asian Dubai residents, and Emirates Hills, a gated community. Data, to the east, as I mentioned, um, is a much more mixed to lower income neighborhood, stereotyped as an Indian neighborhood. So the project manager said the following, the profile of our uh, customer is the Jumeirah resident, an affluent Jume uh, uh, expatriate, um, also the affluent local. These customers prefer not to go to Deir city center because it is not easily accessible, and the traffic within the mall is also not so appealing to them. In other words, the kind of people there, it's a Deir crowd, he said. Our mall will target new markets. Those of, uh, those of the ones I just mentioned, right, the more affluent types. Um, we do have valet parking, he said, for the high-end section, as opposed to the other parts, which don't have valet parking. But you can walk to the high-end part of the mall without having to pay anything. And I, I, I asked him, so can I drive with my really crappy Honda Civic uh, into the valet section without any problems? And he said, you can, but you're probably not likely to, uh, you're probably not likely to, and that's the point. You cannot label an area exclusive. You can only make it harder for pe the people you don't want to be there. People who have nothing to do there. If I'm driving a Honda Civic, I would, go, I would go to that part of the mall and see an Armani shop and realize that there's no way I can afford anything there, so what am I doing there in the first place? <laughs> <laughs> the assistant manager of another prominent shopping mall, owned by a member of the Dubai ruling family, as it happens, when asked what niche his particular mall served, began by telling me that 65% of the population of Dubai cannot afford the prices at his mall. A so-called lost leader in a larger, diversified family corporation, the mall's main purpose, he said, was to provide a certain kind of environment for shoppers. And let me quote him at length. We think we've created an environment that appeals to, to the higher echelon of the local market. Well-traveled, cosmopolitan people who are brand aware at a level above the mid-range, high, dispo high disposable incomes, but more than anything else, they have a very specific idea about their shopping environment. They do not want an enormously high footfall. They do not want to have things thrust upon them as they walk through the shopping mall. So within the boundaries of the architecture itself, we've kept the environment very low key, very laid back, and centered upon the local population enjoying the atmosphere, enjoying the atmosphere, not having to be harassed uh, while they're shopping. Let me cite a third example before I conclude. Even more revealing, I think, were the comments of a project manager of another project, a large gated community. Uh, it was at the time of my interview in 2007 in a relatively undeveloped part of the city. Although the, develop the development was only accessible by highways and large pedestrian un unfriendly access roads, there was a security fence surrounding the residential section. I asked the project manager why the fence was necessary. He responded by saying that it was for security. And when I asked whether the development's remoteness from the more densely populated parts of the city were not security enough, he said that the fence was really meant to prevent wild camels from eating the new greenery and uh, being planted in the development. He then paused and admitted that the fence was maybe overkill. Whether or not Dubai residents are at risk of being run through by wild camels or not, the fence does communicate a clear message, exclusion. The project manager of, of the mall near Jumeirah, already mentioned before this one, um, as he said, you don't need to le label spaces explicitly, you just need to make it harder for people you don't want to be there to access the space. While they do somewhat clearly articulate a spatial logic of class, the comments of the three uh, managers discussed here do not explicitly reference race, admittedly. Yet anyone with any experience of Dubai and who is attentive to the racial hierarchies that pervade the city, um, as anyone would recognize, uh, race is in fact, it does in fact inform, even organize these comments. Terms such as enormously high footfall, things being thrust upon them, and people you don't want to be there evoke the Dubai public spatial context, uh, in the Dubai public spatial context, images of stereotypical South Asian spaces, such as the open air markets in older parts of the city. In reality, these markets are actually much more diverse than just South Asian, but they're stereotyped as such. Uh, especially many Europeans either exoticize or find them uh, uncomfortable spaces and tend to avoid them. The irony, as the second interviewee implies, is that these spaces are also marketed to a local Arab population, local Emirati population, which seeks similar comforts, 
like in Abdul Khalik Abdullah's words, maybe, which has sort of borrowed the, 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 the racial exclusionary logic mm -hmm. of space. Um, the imperial carving of space, according to cultural and racial logics, of essential difference gets adopted by a privileged sector of the local population. And with that, let me come to my conclusion. When in the late 1960s, Britain announced its plans to dismantle its empire east of Suez, there was jubilation in many parts of the British sphere, where popular sentiment viewed London's plans as the culmination of a process begun with Indian independence in 1947. Indeed, the 1950s and 1960s would see European empires toppling across Asia and Africa, largely unlamented by their liberated subjects. By contrast, and contrary to the feeling of national, nationalist optimism, both in the wider Middle East and, at least among the populace, in the Arab Gulf, the rulers of Abu Dhabi and Dubai pleaded with their British masters to stay in the trucial states, as the UAE was then called, mm -hmm. and to continue to offer protection. In any event, the British advised, in any event, the British advised their protégés, they could expect to rule their Emirates, they could expect to rule their Emirates much as they had done in the past if they simply continued to keep in place what they called in the colonial records tribal and federated structures. Um, in other words, not republican structures. And they needed not to worry about the retreat of empire in one crucial respect. As, as an oil-producing region, they could supply their petrodollars to Western military hardware to extreme levels well beyond the demands of necessity, as Timothy Mitchell has shown in his recent book, Carbon Democracy. Today, uh, the Americans have taken over for the British while supplying, uh, 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 supplying a military umbrella and ensuring that the UAE functions as it always had under the British as part of an imperial shield or buffer zone against competing regional projects. But imperial traces and the imperial legacy also leave their imprint in more complicated ways, which go beyond and are, are not reducible to the apparatus of governance and surveillance, war making, and resource security. Likewise, empire does not leave traces only or necessarily in the built environment, uh, such as monumental architecture, or in elaborate systems of mapping, cadastral, population surveys, urban planning, and so on. Dubai was a tiny, insignificant way station of empire, remote both physically and administratively from the major cultural and administrative nodes of the Indian Ocean and the Middle East. Yet to assume that empire therefore had no or insignificant effects on the shaping and trajectory of, the, of modern Dubai is to assume that empire works in similar or identical ways everywhere. My argument here comes out of, the, of a critique of what I have called geographies of imperial centrality, which assume that the major urban centers of empire are the, are the best examples or case studies of imperial urbanism. Imperial urban geography, however, is an example of what David Harvey has called ur, uh, uneven development, perhaps avant la lettre. I argue here that we should uh, bring the peripheries into the center of our analysis of empire. Rather than looking for typical clues of imperial effects, such as the built environment or systems of mapping, I advocate a more quotidian approach inspired by Albert Lefebvre, which in my view can uh, help us appreciate the effects of imperial encounters where they may be hidden or subtle. Everyday spaces for Lefebvre are the products of ongoing struggles and negotiations of hierarchy and power. Consumption, racial anxieties, and hierarchy, and security in the sense of bodily security are a palpable aspect of everyday urban life in Dubai, and takes uh, a specific form, a pattern that has clear antecedents in imperial attitudes and enactments of embodiment and hierarchy in the imperial era. British citizens felt welcome in Dubai because of a collective, active effort to carve out zones of British cultural comfort there. Meanwhile, local elites such as the ruler accommodated and indeed became dependent upon British patronage. This has left significant traces in everyday urbanism in Dubai, from consumption spaces to spaces of surveillance and racial management. In turn, Dubai, today's Dubai has become a welcoming place for other Westerners who, unlike, who, who, like, oh, sorry, who unlike their non-Western counterparts, can leverage their passports and embodiment of Western racial identities for excellent pay and accommodations along with zones of cultural and consumer comfort and well-being. This is one of the major accomplishments of the joint enterprise between Emirati and Western elites over at least the past half century. A quiet and astonishing achievement in a periphery of empire. The end. Thank you very much.